Hello, Petrusa Rati. I'm Jazz Glancy, and welcome back to another episode of Petrusa Dental Podcast. In this episode, we're going to go through how to plan your full mouth adhesive rehabilitation, uh, including the wax up stage and actually putting the wax up into the mouth using a physical mock up, and how to even send the patient home with that mock up so they can test aesthetics, phonetics, and function. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. It's, a, it's great to have you. This is a part two of three, so you need to rewind to episode 103 for the part one of adhesive full mouth rehabs. The concept here with uh, Dr. Devang Patel is we're going to cover the 11 appointments, the traditionally 11 appointments from the very first time you see the patient for a comprehensive uh, examination all the way to reviewing them with an occlusal appliance at the end and all the stages in between of how to get a full mouth rehab done using an adhesive approach. This has been one of the most anticipated episodes ever. Like the amount of DMs I get saying, Jazz, when's part two out? I really enjoyed part one. So uh, here it is, guys. I'm so excited to share with you. And Dev, I mean, shout out to Dev for giving so much value, giving so much away to the Petrucerati. It's really, really great to have educators like you who are all giving, right? That's what you want. You want to share with each other, share knowledge and improve our daily workflows. Now, before we get on to today's protrusive dental pearl, uh, I want to talk about emails, right? Yesterday, I sent an email uh, and the subject was like, why you need to start charging more for your dentistry. And this email has absolutely exploded. I've had huge open rates uh, and it was like an essay type email, but I just jam packed it uh, with some reflections that I had. So basically one of the delegates uh, on the splint course, he did my stabilization splints module uh, and his feedback, five out of five stars, by the way. And then he gave me some feedback and he said, yeah, I need to, capital letters, I need to start start charging more for my splints. And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. So I discussed this with my splint course group, like, yeah, we start charging more splints. But and then I took a step back and I thought, you know what? We need to start valuing our dentistry more. We start charging more for our dentistry. So there's four main reasons why you might not charge enough for your dentistry. Uh, and I suggest four different fixes. Now, if you're not on my email list already uh, and you want to be and you want to check out that email that I sent, then go to protrusive.co.uk forward slash emails. That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash emails. Uh, and on that page, you will to access some of the more popular newsletters I've sent that uh, I've made public for you. So if you don't love me enough to see me in your email inbox a couple of times a month, but you love me enough to actually check out this email, then go on that website. I also want to share some an announcement with you uh, about the course that I'm doing. So I am doing an occlusion one day course, hands-on and theory for the Kana Dental Academy. It's on Friday the 6th of May. And the Kana Dental Academy is one of these diploma programs over 12 days. And the, the cool thing about it is that you can uh, pick out like 15 or 16 different options and make, you know, you know custom make your own uh, postgraduate diploma. The, the full name of the diploma is a PG diploma program in aesthetic and restorative dentistry. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a cool concept, one that's quite uh, uh, popular nowadays to actually uh, design your own diploma because you might have already seen one speaker or, or you're pretty confident with one aspect of what's offered in the diploma. So you can actually customize it to your own learning needs. So this is like a, a diploma cohort that you do uh, for, for several days and you sign up to 12 days. You can do a standalone course as well, but I think there's a lot of value in doing the entire 12 days. If you're looking for uh, an all encompassing course that has you know a bit of perio, a bit of communication, a bit of aligners, a bit of occlusion, a bit of treatment planning, a bit of everything to set you up, ceramics, composites. I mean, some of the speakers are, are, are brilliant. And I, when I was reading through the list of spe uh, the speakers for this diploma, uh, it made me smile about how many alumni of the Protrusive Down podcast, uh, i.e. previous guests that we've had, are on this diploma. Like we got uh, Shaz Memon teaming up with the singing dentist uh, and they're talking about communication. Now Shaz came on episode 37 about uh, personal branding. Uh, Corey Ferran, I mean, I've got so much time and love for Corey. He did a collaboration with us on episode 94, if you haven't checked that one out. And he's doing treatment planning and consent uh, a whole day on that, uh, which is a huge, you know, contemporary treatment planning on the on the diploma program. We've got uh, Shiraz Khan and Hamid Gruel, who did the Rubber Dam episode, episode 26. We've got Nick Sethi, that episode, with uh, episode 59 on ceramic onlays, which you guys love so much. You know, so many of you listen to that again and again, and, and you send me photos of the notes that you make. So that's epic. Chris Waith on sectioning and elevating teeth we had him on episode 85 uh, and and so you know we can call this a protrusive diploma if you want to but you know there are some other amazing speakers i'm just going to just show you the image on screen or put on the blog of this website uh, protrusive.co.uk uh, about who all the speakers are so you can see there's some great names on there so do check that out and if you want to uh, check out the website it's kana dentalacademy.com based in milton Keynes. that's kana k-a-n-a kana dentalacademy.com so you can check out all the dates and all the speakers and see if this is gonna tickle your fancy the course I'll be presenting for the Kana Academy is No Nonsense Occlusion, Pragmatic Principles and a Risk-Based Approach. 
It's going to do exactly what it says on the tin. Dentists will be able to carry out occlusal examinations on each other, as well as muscle and joint evaluations, and be able to take that through onto their examinations on Monday morning. It's about identifying the high-risk patients, the ones for which the occlusion is a super sensitive issue, and how to tread carefully with those patients, as well as the daily skills that you can use to improve the longevity of your restorations. It's occlusion made pragmatic because the best articulator is the TMJ. And finally, the protrusive dental pearl that you've been waiting for before we join the main meat and potatoes of this episode. So the protrusive dental pearl, uh, following on from what I covered last time about how I communicate an oral anterior communication, I'm gonna share with you a few points, a few pointers I've picked up myself about how to communicate uh, an RCT risk. And what I mean by that is um, I actually dread, and, and obviously, obviously I've learned to manage it more now, and I'm going to share that with you, how I manage it now in terms of communication. But uh, I used to really hate treating deep carious lesions. Like, I, I kind of want them to be uh, not very deep so I, I can restore them and, and uh, tell the patient, you'll be fine, don't worry. Or I want them so deep that I know the answer is a root canal. But most of the, the caries that we treat nowadays is like, Oh, there's a higher risk of root canal. It's quite close to the nerve. It's not into the, into the pulp, but it's it's quite close. And therefore, you need to have that whole conversation with the patient that, okay, we're going to do this restoration or this temporary crown, whatever, uh, but there's a chance that you might need a root canal. Do you know what a root canal is? And you explain what it is. And uh, it's, it's, it's messy. It's annoying. It's stressful. And no one likes it when you do a large restoration uh, and then six months later, the patient comes back in pain because um, and, you know if you haven't communicated it to the best of your ability or some patients, they just don't get it, okay? Oh, my tooth wasn't hurting before you started drilling into it and you did this big filling and, oh, oh, you know, you hear this all the time. Oh, my dentist, I think my dentist drilled too much and now I needed a root canal, right? We hear this all the time from our patients. So they don't get it. So how can we make sure our patients get it? So some patients will be just fine with, look, there is a risk that you might need a root canal treatment and explain because the, your decay, remember I always say your tooth decay in your tooth, uh, your filling was very deep uh, and, and that's all they need to know. But if I ever get like a bad vibe or if I just feel that this is a troublemaker patient or uh, they are just not getting it and I need to really make this consent uh, process crystal clear to them, uh, I will say uh, the following, okay? So remember, we treat all our patients differently, okay? Because everyone is different, they have a different personality. So certain groups of patients, I will say this to. Um, I will do the whole thing, you know, your filling, your tooth decay, etc. But then I will say that if we do nothing, then your tooth will eventually be in a worse off situation and you may lose your tooth. And this could be a, a painful process as well. If I do something, then that involves drilling your tooth decay, uh, drilling the soft bits of your tooth away, uh, drilling away the old filling that's leaking. Uh, and drilling is not a nice thing. Your tooth was never designed uh, by God or revolution, whatever you believed in, your tooth was never designed to be drilled. So even the drill is damaging to the to the tooth. So by drilling, I'm damaging the tooth, okay? So there we are, I'm being very real to the patient, okay? So uh, an endodontist called Stephen Godfrey uh, taught me this and I, I, it's always stuck with me. So uh, by drilling, I am damaging your tooth. But if you don't treat this, you're gonna lose this tooth anyway. So uh, I'm gonna try and help you, but your tooth is in a very bad condition and I'm drilling it uh, and I'm hoping that your nerve uh, will make it and, and, and survive this drilling procedure. If your nerve doesn't make it, you might need something called a root canal and explain that. So the reason I like that for certain patients is that you know, I just put my cards on the table and say, okay, yeah, what I am doing is destructive and I don't want to be doing this, but it's your, you got yourself in this position. Your tooth is messed up. So yes, you might need a root canal. Okay. Do you want the risk or not? What do you want to do? So again, it makes it very clear that um, it's a very real eventuality and they might need root canal. And if and when they are the patient that, you know, a few months later, a few years later, they end up um, having an abscess or they end up needing a root canal treatment, you know, they're, they're gonna be one step closer to remembering that, oh, you know what, Jazz did tell me that, you know, the drill is damaging. Uh, so I know this is not everyone's cup of tea, but for that certain type of patient, they really uh, drill it into them, uh, excuse the pun, uh, so that it sticks and it's memorable. And like I said in the previous episode, the whole point of consent is that if they decide that they don't want this treatment anymore, then that's good. Okay, then that's the whole point of consent. You know, you don't say, oh, if I warn them too much, then they'll be scared, then they won't have the restoration. Well, that's the point of consent. If there is a real risk here, 
communicate it. So that's one way to do it. So let me know what you think. E e email me, message on the, uh, our Facebook Protrusive Dental Community. Tell us other ways that you communicate it there, which are innovative or, or useful or memorable for the patient. And remember, this is what I was sharing with you is not the best way to do it. It's just sharing a way that for certain patients I like and that was taught to me by an endodontist. Uh, and I think it, it really sends a message clearly to the patient. Anyway, let's join the main episode with Dr. Devang Patel and I'll catch you in the outro. Dev, welcome back to part two. Uh, we had a really uh, jam-packed, full of information, part one. Uh, and it's, it's it's good to talk about the next step because everyone's now eager to know, what do I do next? What do I do next? So, uh, Dev, just recap for us what we spoke about last time uh, and where we're going to pick up from today. Uh, well, uh, I'm glad to be back, uh, Jez, and thank you again for inviting me. Um, so we discussed about the mindset, which is really, really important. Uh, mindset of full mouth reconstructive dentist very important um, investment, investing in yourself. We talked about appointment one, the mindset was appointment zero, if you remember. Appointment one is really when you're doing examination, you're gathering all the data. You're really discussing with patients what, what are you planning to do. You're doing full mouth assessment, examination. You are kind of, we discussed about conformity versus reorganized approach, how we can do and how, uh, what we're going to do. Um, appointment two now, is really records. So you need to take good set of impressions. Um, you need to take some sort of a Facebook record so you can mount your model. And you would have decided by now that whether you want to restore the case in MIP or CR or CO for that matter. So most of the time, you, I do not uh, mount models in MIP, I would mount model in CR. And even if I'm restoring in CO, I would mount model in CR. And if my mounting is correct, if I drop the pin, it will... It just will just, just want to check, because it's something I'm very anal about. CO, you're using CO as a definition, as an MIP, yeah? No, CO is correct definition of CO. Yes, the centric relation contact point. Okay, fine. So I just want to clarify that, because people listening, maybe they haven't listened to some of the early episodes and like... Yeah, fine. First point of contact. Perfect. Just to recap, because as you quite right, to be honest, the, if you if you pick up uh, glossary of prosthodontic terms of 1999, CO is equal to MIP. Uh, if you if you p pick up, you know, it's different time, different definitions. But um, my understanding is CR is your uh, your um, relationship independent of, of two contacts in a hinge axis and teeth apart relationship. So it's quite reproducible. CO is when you are when your condyles is nicely seated and you're now closing your jaw and first point of contact is centric occlusion and then MIP is when you have the slide or shift or if you don't have a slide if you have five percent of the case then it's you speak MIP. the same language Dev this is the first yeah. time in occlusion two people are speaking the same language very good yes <laughs> because and I, I, I and to be honest you made a great point um, because. When I do the course, I first start with terminologies because there are so many different terminologies to different. I mean, in UK, we use RCP, RAP, ICP. But however, I start, you, I use CR, CO and MIP because that's more generally used terms. But if you, if you, if you, if in UK, if you're reading some UK journal articles, then RAP is equal to CR, RCP is equal to CO, and ICP is MIP, which we know anyway. So what I was saying that we, I would mount model in CR almost all the time, uh, because I'm not going to restore, if I'm doing one arch or full mouth reconstruction, then I'm not going to restore patient in MIP. It's, it's it, for me, it's just not, ideal so i would i, would, I have a chance like, like you to said you're reorganizing we're often uh, increasing the ovd henceforth uh, the traditional way of uh, uh, working in a uh, reorganized centric relation um, sort of position or centric related contact point or beyond the centric relation contact point like we talked about last episode about sometimes when you can uh, open up uh, just exactly what how much you need it gives you an, uh, a playing field where you can get complete control and i, I like that when we discussed that last yes, time exactly. so, so, so remember that everyone and then and also just want to just check there just for those those dentists listening they're thinking Okay, articulator. Uh, what type of articulator? Just briefly. What? Also, which, which is the articulator don't you complicate use? it. I, I, I mean, I do quite complicated uh, full mouth reconstruction. I don't use fully adjustable articulator. Hey, I mean, I use a semi-adjustable articulator. How many times I'm changing condyle inclination? I don't know. I mean, if I do 500 cases, maybe two times. So if you if you even have an average value articulator with the set values. Um, I use DNR, I'm biased because I was trained on DNR articulator, I use it, it works for me, but you can use, you know, different articulators uh, if you want. 
Um, so I use Dina Slidematic Facebook and Dina Articulator. Uh, again, I use semi-adjustable, but you can use average value to save money. And also, if you're starting your journey, you're not going to use any setting of semi-adjustable articulator. And actually, you're risking, if any of the screw becomes loose, then the setting will change and you won't notice, and then all the mounting will be wrong. So just mm -hmm. use, just buy an um, average value articulator where all the values are set. Uh, which is 25 uh, uh, degree of inclination, 7 degree of side, uh, sort of a progressive shift, and 0 degree of immediate side shift. So, so that's all set up, so you don't need to worry about that. Your calibration is much easier for those articulators as well. So I use that. Now, once I've done that, now we haven't really talked about digital, and we can talk about some sometime later, because I am more analog person, to be honest. But if you let's say if you're doing digital, uh, wall in your and you got a scanner then you need to take obviously scans of upper and lower jaw you still need to have some sort of a jaw relationship and scan the patient in that jaw relationship to mount model on an articulator which is digital articulator really so you still need to use a lucia jig or a leaf gauge in order for you to get that CR position and what I tend to do is I would have a bite resistant material squeezed on the back teeth I would take one side of the bite registration material out, scan the bite, put that bite registration back, take the other side out and scan the bite. So then I have a stable occlusion uh, when I'm scanning the bite and the patient's not moving around too much. So well, uh, for those who are watching uh, this on, on, on the like YouTube or the, the app, which is coming soon, uh, I'll have a visual of exactly what this looks like when you take a, a bite, a digital bite in CR and you have all that lovely space. So I can share that with everyone. Those listening, um, uh, Dev made a good point about using bite reg left and right. I personally just use a, a leaf gauge at the front and that stays at the front. Uh, and, and I make sure the patient stays in the position I want them to stay. And here's the magic bit at the desired vertical dimension I'm roughly aiming for uh, to reduce the error in opening. Uh, and then I'll just scan left and right. And yes, exactly. So this is the digital way to, to get the same information as analog. And I'm glad you mentioned that because um, some of our colleagues are digital now. So uh, we, we need to please both the groups. Yeah, exactly. So now th the model gets mounted. Now at this point, many times what everyone does is they would send the patient the impressions and the records to technician and say, look, mount the model, do the wax up. But in my case, I mean, I, I, I personally mount all my models myself uh, because I'm just, I like it. So I would, I would mount the models. I would then assess it um, because I want to really assess the occlusion. I want to assess the plane. So when I'm planning the treatment, this is when I'm more confirming my treatment plan, which I already planned in patients when patient was there. Because as I said last time, use patient's mouth as an articulator. It's the best articulator you can use because you're going to use that, you know, uh, treat the patient in, uh, in the mouth. So make sure that you plan most of your treatment there and then. And then what you're doing is when you mounted the models, you're reconfirming your planning because there are some views you cannot see in patient's mouth. You know, uh, so uh, articulator helps to look at, you know, various angles. Now, there are five things I'm looking at when I'm planning any treatment, not particularly just on the looking at the articulator but just overall so there are five things which i'm which i'm planning one of the first one is which we briefly touched upon is assessing patient patient himself or herself right so my first criteria is if i don't get a good vibe if you're not getting on with each other i will not start the case no matter how simple it is i will not start the case um, it's different when you're doing NHS dentistry and you don't have a choice, you know, you have to treat patients for those main needs, you know, if they have broken tooth and you need to fix it, that's different. Basic health needs. Sorry, yes. Um, whereas we are, we are doing, we are talking about full mouth reconstruction, we have a choice because this is private, it's beyond NHS remit anyway. So I choose who I treat and I choose very carefully now as I as I mature over the years, because I have been bitten before. So I, my criteria is first thing is, am I going to get along with this patient right? Because once you start doing full mouth reconstruction or even single arch, you kind of stuck with that patient for some time. 
So that's one thing. W- one thing, thing that I just want to, to, so it sticks in people's minds, uh, Dev, uh, Ian Buckle, uh, when he used to make the same point, he used to just say very simply, uh, date them before you marry them. And I love that because it is pretty much, when you do a full mouth rehab, it is a marriage. Uh, you know, when something happens in the future, they're going to come back to you and whatnot. So yes, yes date yes, them before you marry them. So sometimes that actually doing, means... Yeah, especially doing full mouth implants upper and lower. That's it. There is, you know, that's the kind of an end game. <laughs> you can't do anything else. Exactly. So, and then sometimes it just means that you need to see them for a couple of appointments so just to go over hygiene and uh, do that uh, uh, filling on the lower left six, which they need because it's caries, to suss out, okay, can they, are they a suitable patient both in terms of their mouth and in terms of their personality profile that matches you going forward? So that's a, a fantastic point well made. Thank you. Yeah, so basically, yeah, so I would assess patient. Uh, what, the other thing I would assess is what they want, you know, their expectations, but that can match their expectation. We are very grateful, to be honest, in the UK, our patient max expectations are quite realistic, to be honest. So um, I never had a patient, well, I would say never, maybe once, maybe I had a patient where I could not match their expectation, but it's just unrealistic. So, um, but otherwise, we are quite good. But you need to make sure that in your your cap- capacity, you have your capacity or skill level to match their expectation. Because once you start these cases, you can't really go back. And we can we can argue day long about the you know composite versus porcelain, and composite is quote unquote reversible treatment. I don't think composite treatment is reversible. Once you bond the tooth really nicely, or once you bond the composite tooth really nicely, if patient doesn't like it, you can't really undo it. You can't really take it out. And patients on you know it, there's no way they'll you never can take go back to the exact same position they were before. Cannot, yeah. So, but you, it's very easy to adjust. And if you're doing full mouth reconstruction for the first time, I would highly recommend start doing adhesive sort of a composite buildups because it's, it's very forgiving, uh, especially if, if your bonding skill is nice, then you know you can, occlusion, you can adjust here and there. So that's, that's, uh, that's what something I uh, assess. The third thing I assess for the patient is non-compliance. So some patients, they want to have a nice teeth, but they don't want to put an effort to have those nice teeth. So they don't want to clean their teeth. They don't want to do good hygiene. Uh, they don't. They miss their appointments. I, I really don't. I look at their history, and I, I tell them from front, uh, from upfront, that you know you need to do all this, record everything, because patient will say on at that appointment that yeah I will do everything. You know I'll stop smoking. I'll you you know I'll see hygienists every three months, but it may or may not happen. So you need to really suss it out what happens, because again I've been bitten before where you know there are patients who fda before with their general dentists and i can see their history is quite patchy uh, and they need a full mouth reconstruction and you know it's a nightmare because they miss the appointment they cancel the appointment their work comes first which is and i understand the problem is we are also working so we can't really i have three hours appointment and a patient a day before cancels I mean, I, I mean, I can't fill that whole gap within 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 twelve hours. So we need we need to understand whether it's patient's priority the, to fix their teeth or not. If patient's priority is not that, then it is likely that they won't take care of it. So that's the. And it that's might the be first that thing. it might be not their priority right now, but it doesn't exactly. mean that you know a year down the line. Uh, I'm sure you've had patients you've given treatment plans for, and they come back some years later because they found oh, yeah. you again, uh, and then then they're ready. So do, you know, it doesn't matter if you lose the case because if you lose the case, it's a good thing because you, you know you decide that this isn't the right patient yet. Yes. Yet being the key word, and in the future 100%. they might be your ideal patient. I mean, I had a I had a patient who I, when I used to do normal checkups and everything, I, I proposed a full mouth reconstruction to him. And he literally laughed at my face and like, what, how much? You know, I can do three holidays to Spain or whatever. So we discussed, we literally discussed four checkups, same thing. And he laughed, same thing. Fifth checkup, he said, yeah, I want to have it done. Because things changed, uh, you know, he broke a couple mm-hmm. of teeth during that two years time. And, you know, he's like, look, things are deteriorating. And I, and I get it, what you want to, what, what you were saying to me two years ago, let's get this done. Okay, so obviously he paid more because now, it's more work two years uh, later on and the prices increase and all Hashtag that. So inflation. Make sure that you give that example to patient, uh, other patients as well that, you know, you may, they may not realize. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is I assess while I'm doing records is load test. Load test means is you're really checking the health of your TMJ. Uh, whether you're assessing whether there is uh, any intracapsular problems. So t- t- around the TMJ, if there is any problems. And for load test, um, I used to make Lucia jig all the time, but um, I find leaf gauge very easy, quick to use for load test. 
Um, for mounting, I'm still old school, so I still use Lucy Edge for mounting because it gives me nice vertical stop and I lock them their bite on my Lucy Edge. So when I'm when I'm asking them to close their mouth on the Lucy Edge, I know that they're closing at the right point because with leaf gauge, um, it's you cannot tell whether the patient's gone further back while by when you put your bite registration material or not. And I don't like to push their jaw. Uh, I just like them to move their jaw for come back, back come comfortably. And that's how you do With the load test, so, so I just want to mention there before you go to the, the fifth one, with the load test is for those people who don't have a leaf gauge, A, get a leaf gauge. So it's a very valuable it's tool very you can cheap. use in many scenarios. Uh, exactly. It's not expensive at all, like 20 pounds, something like that. Uh, and then for, for those who don't have one and they do, they need to load test their patient right now, the other way they can do it is you can get a wooden spatula on one side. Let's say you want to load test the left joint. You can put the wooden spatula between the right molars and then you get the patient to clench on it and then you assist with your hand by pushing the angle of the mandible up. So you're pushing the condyle into the fossa and that's another way to do the leave, uh, uh, load testing for that one joint and obviously you've got to do the same thing for the other joint so it's important to have these baseline measurements including uh, like when I'm doing more complex work I need to I want to know exactly in the millimeters the range of movement I want to know the pathway these are all things that you said you record uh, in that very comprehensive check so you need to have all this information because if something happens later uh, later on you need to medically know exactly what situation your patient was in so please do not take these measurements lightly these are these little details are important yeah and uh, one thing though you can get false positive results with the load testing if your lateral pterygoids are, are a bit, bit stretched so what i tend to do is if i if patients say oh, it's a bit painful around uh, jaw joint area i give uh, cotton wool rolls ask them to bite on both molars tight squeeze release squeeze release and then do the load test again sometimes the pain goes because it's just that the, 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 the lateral pterygoids are tense and then just relaxes. Very so, often. And so it, it just make sure that often. you check To get that. a true positive is, is quite rare, thankfully. So to, to get a true positive load test, and that means that they've got severe intracapillary issues, thankfully, is and not very common. Most of the time, common. patient knows. Most of the time, patient knows when you have true positive. Patient would know that there, there's some issue going on with their, with their TMJ. So make sure, so that if I do find true positive or even sometimes false positive and I'm not really sure, I would give them Michigan splint to start with to make sure that, you know, their, their occlusions, uh, they, they can tolerate the raised OVD, uh, A, their compliance is good. And there are lots of reasons why you should use Michigan splint before uh, your full mouth reconstruction. But it doesn't, when I was taught, I was taught that you need to do Michigan splint for 100% of the cases, full mouth reconstruction, 100% of the time which I don't feel necessary, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. In my opinion, if patients has got sort of low test is positive, you must give them Michigan Splint and you make sure that you don't start treatment until that pain goes. So you need to keep checking. Um, if I'm doing low test, everything's fine. Patient's not in pain, muscles are not tender, and I can really relax that jaw nicely and they go back uh, into CR very nicely, then there's no point in giving them Michigan Splint. Okay, so Absolutely. I would then crack on, uh, especially if you're doing composite reconstruction, you, you've got plenty of time. Even if you're doing direct, indirect reconstruction, you will have plenty of time to check because you're going to do a mock-up, you're going to do your provisionals, and then you're going to do finals. So you, you will have time to sort of test it out uh, as it were. So, so that's that. And then if there are some patients who are genuinely cannot, you cannot uh, relax their jaw at all. In those cases, you can give them some deprogrammer, um, you know, and your course is really amazing. So, you know, you know, you can get some some deprogrammer to use. Uh, I give them, uh, I make a, a bit larger version of a Duralay sort of a Lucia jig, uh, which they can use. But you can get different types of uh, deprogrammer. Give them to take it at home, bring them later next time. So use it for a few days and then come back. And then you can... What percentage you can of your patients would you say would uh, have a splint therapy before doing a, a full mouth rehab? Just so it'd be interesting to know. Yeah, um, very, very rare. I mean, not that many percent. So I would say, I don't know, five to 10 percent maybe. So not, not that many. And, and some clinicians are doing it in a much higher percentage. Uh, and, and that's fine. You know, that's part of their philosophy and it's OK. Uh, but and I, and I think you've given us some good like guidelines about when to consider it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was taught like that and I don't see any issues with that. Having said that, it does um, increase the treatment time, first of all. But also, by giving the Michigan splint, what you're trying to do, you're trying to relax their jaw, right? 
So if you feel that you have their, their jaws relaxed and you know you can go to CR, and this is all about feelings. So remember, I've been doing this for 10 years. So initially, all my cases used to get Michigan splint. Huh? So uh, it, it, you, whether you, when you start getting more experience, you know that this patient's got really tense muscles. You don't want to start the treatment. You want to give them Michigan splint first, make sure they're nice and relaxed. And then having said that, patients who are bruxist, paras, parafunctionists, they will always do that, you know, and you, we know that Michigan Splint for 24 seven is not a good idea. So, you know, for, for all the time. So, you know, you need to take everything with a pinch of salt and modify your treatment according to your experience. But in the beginning, when you're starting, you're not sure. If you're not sure, just get the Michigan Splint. That's the best, safest way to start full mouth reconstruction. And again, if, you, if, you're, if you're not sure, then again, it's another way to check the patient's compliance, to check the patient has really committed uh, as well. Uh, not that, that that's sometimes um, the reason I do it, um, purely just to check their compliance. Very rarely, if they're a severe bruxist, but I can still get their muscles relaxed, uh, then it's fine. But sometimes it's important to, for them to understand that uh, what they've done to their own teeth, they've destroyed them, they'll probably put the restorations under the same stress, uh, unless we can somehow switch off that trigger that they have for their bruxism, which is very difficult. Therefore, in some cases, you might give it uh, for a secondary reason to also check their compliance. Yes, because for those bruxist patients, I want them to wear Michigan Splint after I finish the treatment. Huh? So if they, think, if they say, oh, I can't wear this, then I, I'm, it's, and that's the best point I would say, look, I can't treat you because you know, you're going to break things. I mean, I tell all my patients who are at, uh, treating cases that you will break my, whatever I'm doing to your teeth you know, the 100% chance at some point you will break something. Um, it may last 10 years and you will break it, or it may last, you know, two years. I, I mean, it's very difficult to tell. Um, obviously, we'll do our best to give you the, the best treatment, but, you know, you might break things. So that's that. Once, once I've done the load test, I would then check the type of wear. So how many teeth are worn down, um, whether, uh, and that will... As, that will allow me to decide whether the patient needs single large reconstruction. Um, I just posted a, I posted a case uh, sort of a late December where I've just done single large uh, upper arch. It's, a, it's an erosive case. Patient had a bullying, uh, patient had a sort of a fizzy drinks. She used to drink a lot of fizzy drinks and everything. So she has worn just her upper teeth quite messily and her lower teeth were almost not too bad. So we just single arch reconstruction and lower arch, a little bit tidying up. So depend depends on the where you're going to decide whether you're going to do single arch or you're going to do full mouth reconstruction or you're going to do just anterior reconstruction and dial the patient into the posterior, posterior teeth in with dial means you know uh, orthodontic movement of the teeth without putting braces on right so you you putting you you're doing uh, just anterior uh, build ups and you're allowing pr uh, anterior teeth to intrude and posterior teeth to extrude Having said that, it's it's uh, not very well utilized in the sense that it, the very, there are very strict criteria which cases you can use dial. I mean, if patients got posterior wear, it's a complete no-no. I mean, you you increasing this, you creating this nice space to restore posterior teeth. Why not just restore it there and then? Uh, why just dial the patient? And most of the time, it's it's easy to communicate with patient and sell dial technique because it's cheaper, right? So, you know, it's mm -hmm. full mouth reconstruction is much more expensive because posteriorly you're going to involve more onlays, more, you know, whereas the interior you can just do composite dial, quick, done. Whereas posteriorly... Yeah, that's a great point, Dev, uh, because if you have, like you said, if you've got significant posterior wear, restore it, plan it for restoration, don't leave it to, to dial. Uh, it's very much a interceptive treatment for localized uh, anterior tooth wear. That's the way to think about it. And for those who, if you haven't listened to episode 16 and 18 with Dr. Tiff Qureshi, he really goes into, into full detail over a couple of hours about this uh, really beyond really the remit yeah. of what we're talking because we're talking about the full mouth rehab now. But you, you're a great point. Not every case that you see um, needs to be uh, treated a certain way. You've got to have different different tools in the shed. Uh, so some cases may be uh, amenable to a dull, uh, and, and that's a point well made. Yeah, and also don't try to fit, you know, everything into the tools you have, you know, just because some people just, they're comfortable with dull, they just do dull everything, they dull all the cases, which is not ideal. But anyway, so, so dull, now if you have posterior wear and anterior teeth are completely intact, and I'll share a case uh, at some point where um, I, I've treated a case like that, where um, you just want to restore posterior teeth. Now, how can you do that? Um, you can do orthodontic movement of the posterior teeth, braces, 
intrude the teeth, create the space, or restore the posterior teeth and have braces to close the anterior teeth down because when you when you restore the posterior teeth, you're going to almost increase the uh, decrease the overbite so you know you're going to sometimes can create open bite interiorly if the patient comes with very um, edge to edge almost occlusion and those are those patients who are, have a quite heavy posterior where they, they don't have very deep bite unless they go into CR and grinding their teeth okay but if it's a localized one or two teeth posteriorly then orthodontic treatment helps a lot um, in, in managing them so again how many teeth are involved helps me planning uh, what I'm going to do. Also the type of wear. So if, if patient comes with wear, how would you know whether you need to increase OVD or you need to do crown lengthening and restore the patient in the same OVD because there is a uh, alveolar compensation and there is a comp uh, patient's sort of teeth have already up. And so patient actually hasn't lost any OVD, but the, just the te teeth have already erupted because of the alveolar compensation. And one of the quick way to measure that is assess patient's smile. If patient's smiling and all the teeth are on display, you can't really increase too much OVD because then you're going to give them horse teeth. Okay, so then you need to mm. think about ortho, you need to think about crown lengthening, other things apart from increasing, just increasing OVD. Okay, so, so that's some few things you need to uh, sort of keep in mind when, when assessing where. The... The third yeah, thing, yeah, the just fourth. a point on that, there, Dev. Uh, so no, I'm going to get you continue because I think you're going to come to it. Go for it. So the fourth thing I assess is a curve of speed. So I want my occlusal planes flat-ish if I can. Okay, I don't want very steep curve of speed on the lower. So when I'm assessing my models, that will help me in assessing, okay, how much I'm going to add on the lower arch and how much I'm going to add on the upper arch to get that plane flatter, okay? It's not always possible without orthodontic treatment because the teeth have, may have moved so much, but keep that in mind because sometimes what happens is you have, a, again, alveolar compensation of the lower lower anterior, lower anterior has come up and the posterior is quite lower down. And now if you're building the lower anterior, you are really increasing that steepness of the curve. So to make it flatter, you need to really have quite thick posterior onlays to match up with the level of the incisors. Now, that's when you realize, okay, this really case needs orthodontic intrusion and then treatment rather than just building everything up or a crown lengthening or not build too much length up. So, so, so the really models or your 3D scan will, will give you so much information to be able to assess uh, the occlusal plane and all that information. Yeah, for, yes, exactly. So 3D scan will help you a lot. Uh, patient's mouth, you know, you just look at patient's mouth. Again, it's an articulator. So I really assess a lot when patient's there in the chair. Uh, it helps me a lot when it, with, with planning. And then the rest of it is just literally confirming what I planned. And it just gives me a little bit more time to think about it. When patient's there, I don't want to just have pause and lots of, uh, you know, silences where patient's like, wondering what's going on. So I would do what I need to do. I need to assess what I need to assess and then thinking time will be after patients left. So um, so that's that. And then we assess um, any limiting factors. So you need to make sure that what are the limiting factors for me? If I, I just sometimes receive cases, um, I all, all, right now, I mean, I don't do much checkups. I see patients on referral basis. So I get consultations, patients come to me and uh, sometimes they refer to me for single implant and uh, dentist has done some crowns and some veneers and I think, okay, now this patient kind of needs a full mouth reconstruction. The problem is they've just done a new crown or new veneer. Can I fit my full mouth reconstruction within that without changing it because the crown veneer is really nice, uh, it's really nicely done. We don't want to really disturb the tooth too much and patient, put patient to extra uh, cost. So that's something, it's not a limiting factor, but something you need to build, you need to, you need to make sure that you're aware of it. Another limiting factor, which I believe is quite sometimes with patients who have old dentistry done, is post and core crowns with uh, very poor endodontic treatment. Now, when I raise OVD, we're kind of committing to at least doing one single arch reconstruction. So if the post and core crown is falls within the arch which I'm doing reconstruction for, then I need to change that crown. 
and it's much higher risk when you're removing the post, when you're removing the crown, because if the endodontic treatment's not done very well, so you need to remove the post, do the proper endodontic treatment, and then put a new post in, new crown in, and the cost of seeing a specialist, having all that done, and then it just increases, 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 and then you're thinking, okay, why not just take it out and do an implant? Uh, because even though you do all that, the tooth is going to be very weak because it's already got post in there. You're doing a lot of things in the root. So, so that's something I always need to have a cons cons um, sort of discussion with patient uh, during my uh, treatment planning discussion. The other, so, obviously, so you're right, Swan. Just trying to pick you on old dentistry. Swan, just probe a little bit further with old dentistry. That is a real challenge when you're playing. Old dentistry really gets in the way. It's much nicer to treat those erosive cases where they've just they haven't got many restorations, and you got uh, you can do what you want in a way. But when you got old dentistry, um, you have to be a little bit smarter. Now, one question I have for you is: What about those cases of wear? And I'm sure you've seen loads of these because of the nature of the the clientele you see. That they have um, so much wear on the anteriors that the anterior teeth were root filled at some point and then they continue to wear and now they've got GP exposed, uh, you know, three to three. Um, what are the guidelines that you suggest in terms of uh, doing a re-RCT for every one of those teeth before then restoring it uh, defensively? Because again, it's another factor which can significantly increase the cost of a plan uh, by several thousands of pounds because you're doing now so many uh, re-RCTs and lots of uh, time commi commitment. Yeah, um, for me... Any guidelines on that? Yeah, well, for me, I mean, I... I for me, it's clear cut. If the GP is exposed, that means there is a contamination. And if I'm doing something to that tooth, that tooth needs to be retreated. I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing. I mean, if I'm doing direct composite buildup, maybe I'll take a chance if, if I know the patient very well and everything. But I haven't taken that chance yet. I'm just saying maybe I'll take a chance, but I have not taken that chance yet because I just don't feel. Uh, comfortable because we know that one of the main reason why root canal treatment fail is because of the leakage of your coronal restoration now if the GP is exposed you, you're seeing a lot of bacteria going in and you know maybe yes patient doesn't have pain but when you do something you're going to change that by uh, sort of a flora anyway so uh, patient might then start getting pain so any indirect restoration, complete no no. I mean, I will not even if the if, if the root there is no periapical pathology, but the root canal treatment is short and is not great. I do not feel comfortable doing any indirect restoration on that tooth. I would always send patient to a specialist, or I would do if a specialist because specialists endodontists you know is they are busy. You know they are really at least the area where I am working. And um, if if you know patient needs to wear, wait for months, then I would just do it myself. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to shy away from root canals as much as possible. Um, and, and send wise man, wise man. Uh, but no, I think that's a, a nice clicker answer. If you have GP that's exposed by the time they come uh, and seen you, it's probably exposed for a long time. It's probably contaminated. So although it might raise the, the, the cost of the case uh, overall, it's based on sound principles that you should, before you put thing in indirect on it, uh, treat it textbook. So that's, uh, that answers it clearly. Yeah, I think it's a textbook, but also I've seen a lot of examples because I have associates um, approaching me all the time with their planning and also approaching with me when they have done something and hasn't worked out. And I've seen a lot of cases where they, they feel trapped when they have done that kind of treatment without doing re root canal. And now patients turn and say, look, it wasn't painful before. And they completely forget the discussion you had with them that you know it may get painful it's com it's completely out of there they don't remember that because you know a lot of things goes on and it's very difficult to ha remember every single thing you tell the patient for for the patient for you it's easy but for patient they're gathering all the information so mm, yeah i don't mm, i don't so tend to take chances sure so then the other clear cut limiting factor is existing implant which are good so if, if doing reconstruction and implant is in the right position then it's fine. You just change the crown, you're done. But if paint implant is not in the right position, you want to do ortho, you want to move the teeth, then you, you are kind of limited by the position of that implant. Now, if it's in the molar area, maybe it's easier, but if it's in the anterior area, a few degrees uh, can change the implant restoration from screw retain to cement retain. I personally don't prefer cement retain restorations, um, but, um, you know, it just changes the method of, of how you're going to restore the implant. So implant is uh, one of the one of the reason 
you, know, you need to um, it's, a, it's a limiting factor the other limiting factor which is supra erupted teeth which you would see a lot uh, if you start restoring cases which is heavily wear edentulous areas some of the areas where teeth starting supra erupt so much so that even if you're increasing OVD you can't get a occlusal plane to, to flat and and you especially the posteriors you start getting sometimes this um, big slides because of those supra erupted teeth so in that case you need to have a discussion with patient whether they're happy to have intentional endodontics chop the tooth down and then do a, an only uh, on that or extraction implant or orthodontic movement obviously so that's what we discussed before as well so it's it's these things these nuances you need to really be keep in mind there are lots and lots and lots of them i've just stopped, touched upon a few just a real world sequencing question there but i mean these important considerations and, yeah. and important discussions that you have with the patient mm -hmm. you've obviously seen the patient for a comprehensive evaluation you've given them an idea you've gained some sort of commitment for them you've probably charged them uh, some degree of money to do some planning uh, and now you've got your articulators uh, you've done your uh, process you've done your load testing uh, in your mind's eye you know your limiting factors you know about the implant uh, some compromises but these sort of next lot of discussions that you figured out based on doing your um, articulator analysis and you, and, you, and you decided that actually I need to discuss this further with the patient because there are some decisions the patient needs to make. Should we extract this? Should we do ortho? Are you inviting them back and then presenting um, an ideal plan and having those discussions again? And if yeah, so, how long does that take? 100%. So this is, so first when I do the treatment planning, I would have said about most of the limiting factors to them anyway, because this is quite obvious factors, so you know them. Um, so patient would have almost 80% idea what to expect uh, when they see me, 85 to 90%, I would say. Um, and the only reason the treatment plan, my treatment plan when, I, when I'm planning is 90%, 95% there, 90 to 95% there when patient's first appointment. And the only reason it changes a lot sometimes is because I've forgotten to put something in, like whitening or, you know, and I need some time and, you know, you just carried away with things. So that's why I never tell patients that this is the final treatment plan. I would do mounting, I'll assess everything. Even when I'm doing mounting, I might, might put some wax uh, here and there just to have an idea uh, to, to, to whether I will be able to achieve what I want and how much opening and everything. For all direct cases, I do all my wax up myself. Um, because I, it's it's just easy because then I'm building that in patient's mouth so I know the anatomy I know exactly the shape how I'm going to get the shape especially when you're doing the interior but now with you know um, uh, injection molding technique or smile fast uh, you can you, you know you, you can avoid knowing too much about the anatomy and all that but uh, I'm still old style so I'll do uh, I'll do backs up myself and I'll do direct build up myself so after this appointment, patient comes back again and I will give them the full analysis, full treatment plan with still ifs and buts because, you know, you never know when you remove old amalgams, what you're going to find underneath it. Sometimes the cusp goes and you're planning to do single, simple MOR DO restoration and now it becomes a non-lay because one cusp just flew off. So you need to you need to let patient know. Uh, you also need to let patient know about the root canal treatment for those deep old amalgam fillings. Having said that, using adhesive techniques and adhesive onlays, I've done thousands and I could I could probably count five or six patients which got pulpitic after treatment. So you know many dentists get scared of removing these big amalgams. Um, it's pretty safe because the nerve has already created that tertiary dentine, you know, protection around the thing. So, you know, you're quite all right, unless there's active caries and you're now digging the caries out. So, um, because you're doing adhesive uh, restorations, even the sound amalgam comes out in my cases. So I remove all the amalgam out and replace them with composite. So uh, I'll have a chat with patients. Once patient's happy and once I've got the plan, that's when I would send either, I would do the wax up or I would send models to technician to do the wax up. So that's when the wax up's going to happen. Now, of course, if... At, at this point, Dev, have you presented any sort of uh, imaging? Like some people like will give them an image of their face and like a, a digital mock-up of what their smile could look like uh, yes. as uh, something to motivate them or something to show them, to something for them to go away with and, and make it more real for them. Um, most of my cases, I show them previous cases, before and after, so they mm. kind of can imagine. Sure. Um, okay. I... I 
sometimes what I do is I just take photos and I'll send it to technician because although I'm quick at doing analog, I'm quite rubbish and takes time to doing digital. So I'll send it to technician, they'll do digital kind of max up on patient's mouth, uh, do that sort of a before and after and send it to me. And I'll show them to patient if patient's quite aesthetically driven. Um, but otherwise, uh, or sometimes what I've done is I've taken quite a lot sort of expired composite, just literally d direct quick mock-up in patients there and then, well, on, on the model and then show them how it looks like, you know, how it's going to look before and after. So if you want to do pay a pro tip is models. to use an expired composite on the models and a not actual composite. Uh, and the reason I mentioned this, Dev, is because you've got all these uh, bank of cases that you've done. You've got all these um, cases that you can show the patient. But uh, the dentist who perhaps are new to full mouth uh, rehabilitations uh, and taking that next step, they may not have cases that they can show. So at that point, you can do some sort of like a 3D um, imaging, uh, saying to your technician, you could do a wax up, you can do an intraoral mock up, or even better, do it on so the model, just like you suggested. Yeah. Using some expired composite perfect yes 100 percent. so in expired composite is really helpful uh, if you ask your boss you know i'm sure they will have some expired composite lying around um you put it on a model and then quickly so you you avoid the cost of uh paying for a wax up before patient says yes to the treatment plan right because you don't want to have a full mouth wax up done show it to patient patients like oh, i'm not interested so I, mm -hmm. I would i would present the treatment plan sometime if i'm not sure I would charge them for a wax up. I would charge them for a full mouth wax up, everything, and then present the treatment plan. They would have some sort of estimate before, but I would, I would do the wax up and then present them the proper treatment plan later on. And that happens a lot of times because I need to realize, I need to make sure that whether, mainly it's because whether they want veneers on the anterior or they just want edge bonding and palatal. So you want a full functional reconstruction or you want some aesthetic component to it as well. So if they want a veneer, and if, if I put, if I do two type of wax ups, so technician can do not putting anything on the buckle, wax up, and then another model, uh, duplicate that and do another with the buckle wax, uh, sort of and wax on the buckle. And then we can do trial on both and show it to patient to, 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 to show a difference. And mock up is the next step. So the next step number three or appointment kind of number three is a mock up, All right? So mm -hmm. now you decided what you, you're going to do. Uh, plus or minus veneers on the buckle. Uh, you ask technician to do a wax up. So patients, uh, technician done the wax up. And then now you're going to take that wax up, use putty indices, bisacryl or acrylic, whatever resin you have, and transfer that into patient's mouth. I have a video of that uh, demonstrating it. it says you need to score the model. Um, so then there is less of the excess coming through the putty. You just pick up the bar and just below the sulcus. So um, then you're just going to score it a tiny bit. Don't need to extend too much, maybe one or one and a half tooth either side is fine. So it needs to be thick enough to hold the rigidity. You can go sort of on the Then when patient comes in, we're just going to squeeze the material in there, temporary crown and bridge material in here and seat it in patient's mouth and let it set. Um, take it out, remove the excess and show it to patient how it will look like. Okay, so that's your mock-up. So this is just the 
temporary mm. to show you how it will look like when we finish. It's very, I mean, it's good for even you doing single to anterior tooth, you know, when you're doing wax up, uh, you must, must do a mock-up in patient's mouth. So mm -hmm. mock-up is something mm -hmm. you do in patient's mouth, wax up is on the model, yeah? So that's the difference. So, so the mock-up, when I'm doing the mock-up, I would make sure you wet the model, make sure it's wet, because when you put the putty on the model, sometimes it gets stuck if model's really dry. So I wet the model, put the putty on there, then cut the, uh, cut the putty so that it's not too much excess. When you're making that putty indices or uh, any PVS indices, make sure that it's thick. So you need around five millimeter good thickness so that when you're pushing it, it doesn't bend, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I, I've done both ways. So I've used uh, light body after the putty set, put light body in there, put it again on the model, squeeze it really hard to make sure you get nice finer details. And I've done it without. Uh, and they both work if your impression's accurate. You know? So the main thing mm. is your impression needs to be accurate, model needs to be accurate. Um, I tend to put um, on the model, take a very uh, sort of a medium small round burr and put a, a small notch around the crevices so that, uh, and again, that's shown on my video, but small crevices on the, on the, on the model. So when you put the putty, it compresses uh, it, it goes into that area and then when you put it in the patient's mouth it compresses around the around the sulcus area so that it's a clean cut and you know mm. you don't get too much excess and it's easy to remove so, so it's like a little groove just it's just like a little groove yes. that you make and some people even use an old ultrasonic scaler an old one a little tip and you can run it across it as yeah. well something just to equate that demarcation yes uh, just don't use a new ultrasonic scaler your boss won't be happy yes <laughs> so uh, <laughs> just make sure the round burst is quite easy it works the only thing is just yeah. it, it's very easy to drill really hard in the the stone is very soft so you have to have a very soft light hand to just do that um in the mouth i would uh, depends um i'm going to put the vaseline on the teeth which i'm not going to put the wax on uh, the, the mock-up on so then it's easy to flick things off if it they do go. I'll put PTFE on every interdental area, which is long PTFE, which comes through the putty indices. So then when I seat my putty, I can pull through that PTFE through the putty so that interproximally a uh, patient can still put the TP brushes. Because remember, I'm going to leave patient with this wax up for at least the mock up with, for at least a week because I want them to assess. Okay. I want to assess their TMJ. I want to assess the muscles. I want to assess the speed sound. I want to assess whether they're breaking anything. So there are a lot of things I want to assess. Now, if, if some teeth are added a little bit, very little wax, then I would spot etch that before I would uh, put this mock-up in patient's mouth to, to give a little bit more retention, okay? No bond, just a spot etch um, uh, in the middle of the uh, middle of the buccal surface or whichever surface you put in the, the resin. Um, so it just holds it a little bit better. But if you shrink fit, which means you're putting this in patient's mouth and leaving it, until it completely sets and you take it out, even if one part of the area is a bit thinner, the other parts will hold that thinner area well. So usually it's, it's not a problem. Once that comes out, okay, fine. I would uh, use either a burr or uh, I tend to start with a blade, a number th uh, 12 blade to remove the excess material. Uh, and then if, if I think I need to do a bit more, then I'll use a burr. If you have a, a void, which you will see in the video, there is a void, then you can literally use the same shade composite and just fill the void. You don't need to repeat the whole thing. Uh, if, if the incisal edges hasn't come ac across really well, then you can just build the incisal edges. I tend to then um, polish them really well because they tend to stain quite easily, especially bisacryl. Mm. If you're using the nice uh, resin, acrylic resin, um, you know, the ones uh, we use like a PMMA based, uh, acrylic resin. Unifast or... Um, yeah, exactly. Triad. So that they are very good, right? So, but if you're using bisacryl, it leaves this gooey sort of a surface on the on the surf, uh, on the the buckled surface after. And if a patient drinking tea or coffee straight away, then it will stain quite badly. So make sure you polish them really nicely and then uh, give them patient, give patient hygiene instructions so how to clean them, make sure they, they know that they can't floss between because they're connected, how to clean them. At this point, I would have only done anterior 
uh, mock-up. Huh? I'm not doing the full mouth. I'm doing anterior mock-up with, with if, if I want to look at the, the arch, the posterior, then the buccal cusps of the posterior teeth are done. Um, so then I can have the occlusal plane idea and I can hold that. But anterior wax up is the more important one. If you've done full mouth, that's fine. It's just a little bit more trickier, more take time consuming to doing full mouth wax up uh, in the first go. So anterior wax up. So just to clarify then, Dev, uh, here you're, ju you're, you're just, um, when you're loading up your putty with the bisacral, like integrity or pro temp four, whatever, you're only doing it on the anterior teeth. So the patient will go away and the patient will look like as though they've had a dial because they've had uh, upper three to three, lower three to three, or lower upper four to four, whatever. Four to four uh, is that what you're doing? Yeah. Or um, you're actually doing the lower full arch? No, four to four, upper and lower four to four. I would have tech asked technician to just do four to four and duplicate the model so, so that your putty seats very well. Huh? Because if they have done the full wax, wax up and you've taken the putty indices from the full wax up, then the putty won't seat very well. So you need to mm -hmm. ask technicians no to location the model. Yeah, so, but if, you, if you've done the full mouth, then that's fine. You, you know, everywhere there will be, a, and it's, it's a good way to check. But for me to check the occlusion, it's much easier if it's just the four to four to make sure my mounting's correct. And that's what I'm going to build first anyway. Uh, if I'm, and again, we are discussing about the steps of adhesive full mouth reconstruction mainly because that's much more easy and practical. If you're going into full indirect uh, restoration, then it, it becomes a bit more complicated or a bit more complex, shall I say. Uh, but I'll go through indirect steps in a minute as well. But for now, I'm doing four to four, upper and lower, to give myself some idea as to how my mounting was. So when I'm, I'm at this point, I'm checking patient's occlusion. So patient bites, I want to check whether the occlusion in patient's mouth is the same which is on the articulator. If it's not, then we have a problem. We have a problem mm -hmm. which means that somewhere in the process things have gone wrong, right? So if, if the occlusion in patient's mouth doesn't match up in the articulator 90%, 95%, then there is a problem. I mean, if you, you will be surprised how many times it matches up 100%. Huh? If, you, if, you, if you're if you really methodical, if you do a really good job, it matches up really, really accurately. Even though you're using semi-adjustable articulator, we're using all the Facebook, which which many people think that you know is useless and it's not proven that it's useful. Still, we're using it, um, but it's still for me it, it gives you gives me sort of a reproducibility. So I've checked the occlusion, make sure everything's fine. What if the occlusion is not fine, right? So what are you going to do if the context not great? So what I first thing I would do is I'll start adjusting them on my uh, provisional uh, on my mockup and see whether I can get them right by doing adjustment. If I'm going to do a lot of adjustment and everything's changed completely, then it's going back to drawing board. But if I've done a little bit of adjustment, but it's more than sort of 5% kind of ish adjustment, then I'm going to, but patient's happy after that, then I'm going to take measure impressions of that. And I'm going to duplicate the model because I will then use that as my indices to use my, for my indices when I'm doing the build-ups, okay? So mm -hmm. two scenarios, two ways you can work out. Either you repeat everything, start from the scratch, but what you don't know which, which, which process things gone wrong. And there are things in place you can check every single step, but you know, for me, if I adjust it because I'm going to do composite, it's easier. And also, even if you're doing indirect, if you're there about 5%, then you can still refine it in your provisional stage. So, so that's I'm checking all the F sounds and you know third so patients sounds. Patients now got gone away and they've uh, aesthetically they show their family and stuff and they're looking grey and they come back and you've checked the occlusion. Uh, where do we now go from this situation where you got uh, anteriors pretty much waxed up? You haven't yet waxed up the posteriors by the sounds of it, or have you done also a full mouth wax up? Mm, no, I mean I would assess the posterior whether I have enough spacing for spacing to make sure, you know, if I'm not sure I would wax up the posterior to make sure I have enough space, but you can measure different ways whether you have enough space for posteriors or not. But no, I'm, I, I tend not to wax up posterior. Um, I used to do everything full mouth, but this is now I'm following this for, especially for adhesive uh, reconstruction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I would do that and then, but if you're not sure about patient aesthetics and everything, 
by all means, ask technicians to duplicate and do full map back up, you know, so there's no harm in doing that. Uh, it's always better to have a more information than less. So now the patients come back in one week time. I'm assessing same thing again. I'm assessing whether the occlusions changed because it could be that my uh, patients changed the CR, right? So the, the patient's gone more relaxed and the, the jaw has gone further back and now patients off my ramps, which I made. Um, by the way, I can, again, um, it's, it's very important for you and technician to know what type of palatal shape you want to create when they're doing wax up. And most of the technician gets it wrong, okay? Because they're trying <laughs> to create a natural palatal shape, which we're not trying mm -hmm. to achieve. We, we, the shape which I have, uh, which I get is very artificial. Uh, it's a nice perpendicular, so I want lower incisor to, to touch per, almost perpendicular to that platform so that you get mm -hmm. quite a good force, uh, you're not getting angled force on the anteriors. So there's a particular shape, again I have a nice photo showing that, uh, if you can remind me and I'll, I'll share that with you, um, or now uh, at some point we can share, I can share that. So with regards to the second time a patient comes back, I'm checking occlusion again, checking any breakage of the rest, uh, temporaries, I'm checking the TMJ, making sure the patient not having any TMJ, pain muscle pain or anything like that um yeah, and absolutely. obviously checking making sure patients happy with what they want to do now once that's done i would then take everything off okay the reason being that the gum becomes quite um although they're doing their best i want my gingiva to be healthy perfect when i'm doing my bonding okay so so i'm taking all the all the uh, um, mock-up out when you're doing that, just make sure you tell patient, you know, I use sickle scaler to just flick them out, hand scaler. Uh, you mm -hmm. can, if it's quite thick, sometimes you can use a burr uh, and then just flick that, like crack them and then take them out. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have a lot of undercuts, then what I tend to do sometime is I would fill those undercut first with either uh, putting some sort of a, I don't know if you use, um, you can use cavit or like on you know sometimes you get really big cuppings on the wear cases on the incisal edges like huge mm. cuppings mm -hmm. and then if you if you put if you put uh, your mock up in there it gets locked in there and then it's very yes. difficult to take it out so for those i would preempt them and i would put we use a temporary filling material so we call it tfm um, so you put that mm -hmm. the on on there and cure it so that it's quite soft so it's easy and then put them up this, this is obviously a resin based like telio i imagine like, uh, exactly, something like telio. Telio yeah, yeah, exactly same thing yeah. uh, tfm is you know you know dent telio is uh mm -hmm. um uh, river Cla uh, uh, Cla yeah. Cla isn't it i'm trying Cla to think who, who, who it is yeah yeah i think Voco. So. So maybe it's voco is it voco okay i become voco yeah that's fine so so same thing so i would you put that to block the undercuts before i put my mock-up in so make sure because then it makes your mock-up quite easy to take it out otherwise it's nightmare patients I mean, like you, one thing we didn't uh, uh, touch on but, i mean we're going to be wrapping up the this episode before we then re-record for the final part to go into the nitty-gritty details but well just one thing to to check is at the time of adding your bisacral did you do any preparation to teeth a, to make sure that your bisacral will be a bit thicker, because it's, if it's very thin in, in some areas, uh, it's going to be a bit an issue. I know you've got some thickness from other areas. Uh, and B, to remove any uh, thin, sharp bits, which you know you're going to be losing in the future anyway, maybe with a soft flex disc. Have you put any consideration to uh, just doing some adjustments before you send them home with this uh, bisacral uh, test drive for a week? Um, I try not to. The reason being that this is still a test drive, okay? Patient can still go out from there and say, look, I don't want this. And I want that opportunity for me to say, look, I haven't touched your teeth. And, you know, you, if you don't want any treatment, that's done. No harm done kind of thing. If I'm now changing something, then patient, like, you put a drill to my teeth, you know, things. So mm. I, I prefer not to. But yes, if, if there is a very sharp edge, I would tell patient. And by this time, my rapport would be really good. Anyway, patient like, yeah, I'll do whatever. So, you know, you can just nicely uh, edge, make them smoother edges, but generally the edges are sharp because you have cupping. And what I tend to do mm -hmm. is uh, I, I, I fill that up with telio or some sort of a temporary material rather than drilling them. 
okay and no i don't mm -hmm. drill the buckle surface of the um comp because remember i want freshly cut surface for my bonding so i'm going to do mm -hmm. that anyway when i'm going to do bonding so i don't want to drill the remove that uh, aprismatic enamel now get contaminated and then have to remove again some of the enamel for my bonding so mm -hmm. my uh, mm -hmm. my aim would be to try and keep this i'll tell patient that you know it'll chip and break anyway so patients are aware of it yep. just may warn patient that is it may chip or break brilliant well uh, i think what we're going to do then is uh, take a little break a little refreshment break uh, and then we'll come back for part three which will release next week uh, and then in part three we can now go from okay now they've had their mock-up you've test driven it you're happy with the occlusion aesthetics uh, and then how to now actually make it into the the final form i.e. full mouth form uh, through adhesive re rehabilitation. Uh, so stay tuned for that, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And we're going to catch you in very shortly next week. Well, there we have it, guys. Thanks so much for listening all the way to the end. Always really appreciate you guys coming all the way to this bit. And part three, the, you know, part three of three of this adhesive full mouth rehab, uh, as we get more and more gritty, the sequencing of you know how to place which composite, the different stents to use, the different techniques to use, that's all going to be covered in the next part of this series, which probably be two or three weeks away. I've got so much coming your way, including a Top Gear style review of all the different IPR systems, like how do you do IPR with a burr versus a strip versus a disc versus an oscillating handpiece and showing you videos of how, you know, 4K videos, 30 gigabytes worth of videos of how to do this, uh, all coming on the podcast very soon. So stick around and uh, subscribe to the emails if you haven't already. And I'll catch you same time, same place. Take care, guys.